Well, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. Um, it's really a pleasure to be back back in Dublin. Uh, I spent five years here um, and my son was born up the road in the Rotunda, so it'll always feel like a, a home from home for me. And it'd be nice to return physically in the, in the near future. Um, okay, so I'm gonna take you on uh, somewhat of a journey today, but it, it, metaphorically, it's the road from the Dunsink Observatory in the north of Dublin into 11 dimensions. Um, and this is going to be guided by the notion of symmetry. Um, to be a little more concrete, I want to discuss the role of symmetry in mathematics and in the laws of nature, and in particular, uh, centered on uh, the work of William Hamilton, very appropriately, who uh, was a Dubliner who held the chair, uh, held the chair in the Dunsink Observatory, whose work has had tremendous influence on mathematics and physics. Every single undergraduate in either of these disciplines will have encountered Hamilton's ideas over and over again in the course of their studies. So it seems very seems a very fitting topic. I should warn you that I'm going to begin relatively pedestrian, um, but it's quickly going to speed up. And if all goes to plan, by the end of the lecture, uh, you should all be completely bewildered and have no idea as to what's going on, but just to be filled with many questions, which is the whole point after all. Okay, so let's get going. Now, we all have some idea of what we think we mean by symmetry. Uh, we learn about it as children and we can see it in nature and see it in art and in fashion and all around us. Um, but I want to try delve a little deeper and really understand more precisely what it is we mean by the term symmetry. And to begin this, I want to suggest that really a symmetry should be thought of an operation as something you do that leaves something unchanged. Uh, we can think about this in terms of reflections, right? A re if something is symmetric under reflection if the before and after image are indistinguishable. So take, for example, this uh, illustration by M.C. Escher that I've put on the right, um, the tessellating uh, fishes. Now, we can see that this has a rotational symmetry. If the, if the ball is rotated around, its before and after pictures are the same. And it also has a reflection symmetry. We can reflect this illustration by any of these pink lines. And the before and, Im before and after images are indistinguishable. And there are other types of symmetry, such as translation. So if you take the pattern um, in the bottom right, we can see that you can shift the pattern to the left or right, or up and down as indicated by the pink arrows. And again, the before and after images, having done these translations, are indistinguishable. So that's the kind of intuition that I want to get at. But as a mathematician, I really want to be more precise. And the mathematical articulation of symmetry goes by a discipline called group theory. And I've, I've tongue in cheek said that this is the theory of taking all the fun out of beauty. Um, but really, I think actually what's, what's amazing about this subject is that in understanding abstractly in mathematical terms what we mean by a symmetry, in distilling its essence, um, and abstracting that essence, we actually open up a whole new world that is more beautiful than we could have imagined. And I want to guide you through some parts of that story. But let's begin more slowly and just consider what we mean by, uh, consider what a group is. Well, a group, and I've denoted uh, an example by the big, by capital G, big G for group, is a collection of things. Uh, we call this a set. So here I've denoted these objects, uh, at A, B, C, D, and so on, you can imagine. It's just some collection. And we can think of these uh, uh, elements of this set, the A, B, C, D, and so on, as being symmetry operations. To illustrate this, we can consider a, a triangle. Now, a triangle has some symmetries. We all know that. So I can take the blue triangle in the center of the page, and I can rotate it by 120 degrees, for example. And then the triangle before the rotation 
is indistinguishable to, from the triangle after the rotation. Now I've adorned this triangle with some numbers on the vertices, one, two, three. Um, but these are just, these are external to the triangle. They're not a part of the triangle. And the reason I've put them there is just so that we can keep a track of what we're actually doing. Because of course, the triangle is left completely unchanged by any symmetry. So without those adornments, we wouldn't know what we had done. But we can just see by following where the one, two, three have gone in the triangle that we've rotated it by 120 degrees. So we can think of a group as a set of symmetry operations in this, in this context. But of course, that's not all. These symmetry operations have to have a little structure. And we can think about what this structure should be just by considering what we expect to be true. So first of all, we have this property called closure. Now, I've rotated my triangle by 120 degrees. Uh, and then I could consider another symmetry operation, let's call it B, which is reflecting about the vertical axis. I've called it reflect about three. And that does something else to the triangle, which of course, again, leaves this triangle invariant. The before and after pictures are the same. So I can do A followed by B, and this is some other symmetry operation, a new symmetry operation. Uh, it's in fact reflecting about uh, the, the vertex uh, two. Let's call that C. Now, given that A followed by B is some other symmetry operation, if we're going to consider the group of symmetries of the triangle, C should also belong to that set. So closure just says I can compose two symmetries together, to get a third, and that third one must also belong to the group. So there's two things here. There's the composition of symmetries, and I've denoted that composition by a little circle. It's just putting them together. Here, composition is just doing each symmetry operation in order. Now, another thing uh, that we'd expect a group to have is what we call the identity element. This is the do nothing operation. So if you think about it, everything that you can conceive of has at least one symmetry. The before and after picture of absolutely anything is the same if you just do nothing to it. And we call this do nothing operation the identity. Now, why is it called the identity? Well, if we think about what happens if we do nothing, we, we, we see where this identity name comes from. So I can consider doing nothing to the triangle and then rotating it. Well, that's just the same as just rotating it. So if I compose do nothing with rotate, i.e. E composed with A, it just gives me back rotate. I just get back A. The, the do nothing operation leaves the identity of all the other operations invariant. It just takes A back to A and B back to B, and C back to C. So we call it the identity operation. Okay, well, what else do we expect of a group? We've got closure and we've got the existence of an identity. Well, another thing is, another thing that we expect is that for every symmetry, there is an inverse operation. If you like, you can call it the never mind. I choose to rotate by 120 degrees. And then I think, well, I could also just rotate anti-clockwise back by 120 degrees. I can undo any symmetry operation. Um, so you can think this is like a, a never mind. Never mind, I didn't want to do that. Let me just go back on myself and undo it. Uh, if only life were that simple. Now, of course, if you do something and then you undo it, it's as if you did nothing. So the rule is uh, A composed with its inverse gives you the do nothing operation. It's as if you never did anything. Now, the final thing that a group has, the final property that a group has to satisfy, is something called associativity. And I've expressed it in this top equation. Uh, parentheses A composed with B composed with C is the same as A composed with parentheses B composed with C. Now, I'm just going to leave that as a homework assignment uh, for you to think about why you might want to include that in your rules for a group, in your axioms for a group. Now, now that we've said, uh, we, we said what the rules for a group were with the crux of a triangle to kind of motivate and illustrate them, but having done it, we can just kick away the triangle 
And we can just say that's what a group is. A group is any set that satisfies these rules or axioms. So, so as an example, you could take the set of all uh, whole numbers and you could take the composition law, the way you add, the way you combine these whole numbers together to just be plain old addition. Then if you think about it, the identity element, the do nothing element is just zero. If you add zero to any whole number, you just get back that whole number. And the inverse to any number is just the negative of that number. If you add one to minus one, you get the identity element, you get the do nothing, you get zero. So the set of whole numbers with the composition rule addition, with the identity being zero, and the inverse of a number just being its negative, forms a group. In a sense, this is a symmetry, but it's in a kind of abstract sense. Really what I'm hiding here is a whole other a connected branch of mathematics called representation theory, but that's for a whole different set of lectures. Okay, now this example that I gave about addition of numbers uh, being uh, forming a group um, illustrates a prop has a property, right? Addition is what we call commutative. It didn't matter in what order I composed these two numbers. Four plus six is ten, which is also equal to six plus four. A composed with B is equal to B composed with A. This is fortunate because uh, otherwise uh, paying for things, you'd have to bear in mind what order you got your coins out of your wallet. And mercifully, we don't have to do that. But not all operations are like this, right? Putting on your shoes and socks, that really does care about the order in which you do it. And groups are the same. They're not necessarily commutative. It's not necessarily true that A composed with B is equal to B composed with A. And I've illustrated this to the right with these, uh, with these operations on triangles again, of course, always the triangles. So in the left-hand branch, I first rotate by A, and then I reflect using B, and I land up with the triangle with vertices starting at the top, going clockwise, reading three, two, one. But I could also first reflect by B and then rotate by A. And then I find that my triangle is left in the two, one, three position. These are not, these do not compose to give you the same group element. Uh, I'm kind of belaboring that point because it's gonna be important to us later. Okay, so we've just done a little bit of undergraduate mathematics. We have said what a group is. It's a collection of objects, uh, uh, we call it a set that satisfies four axioms, closure, identity, inverse, and associativity. And that's, to a mathematician, that's what we mean by symmetry. That's the mathematical articulation of the term symmetry. Now, given this abstraction, that's not where, you know, a mathematician would never be content with this. We've got to play mathematical Pokemon and collect them all. What are all the groups? How many are of them? What are they like? Can we describe them all? That's the next question a mathematician would ask. Now to give an example of what I mean by this problem of collecting them all, um, it was shown already in 1891 that there are 17 uh, wallpaper groups. What I mean by this is that these are symmetries of patterns uh, of, that you could write down uh, that you can make wallpaper out of. And I, I've illustrated, um, well, I've borrowed an illustration of all 17 here on the right. Um, and we find these kind of patterns very aesthetically pleasing and they turn up in culture throughout time and place. So from porcelain in China to decorative cloths from the Sandwich Islands. And in fact, uh, according to some, all 17 of the wallpaper groups can be found in a single place, the Alhambra Palace in Granada. And I've given two, two examples of patterns from uh, the Alhambra Palace to the right here. But is that all of them? I mean, that didn't, we, we found 17 examples, but it didn't tell us whether those were all the groups. And that's what a mathematician would really like to get a handle on. And in fact, we can and we do know what all the groups are. This statement, uh, th this statement goes by the name of the enormous theorem. Um, for good reason, I'll come to it in a moment. Now, the idea is that we have classified, we have found all what are called finite simple groups. And you can think of these as the atoms of groups. 
any group can be built up out of these, these indivisible blocks. And the proof that we found um, all of these groups, uh, all of these finite simple groups, stretches over 10,000 pages, hence the name, the enormous theorem. And just to give you some sense of the monumental task that this was, in the 80s, it was thought that the theorem was complete, uh, but some people found that there were chinks in the armor. And one of these, one of these failings in the proof took a further seven years to patch up. It's a really monumental and beautiful achievement. Now, I'm not going to describe to you what all of these uh, finite simple groups are, but I can say that there are 18 infinite families of finite groups. Now, you might ask, why should there be uh, infinite families of symmetry groups? Well, it's not actually that hard to understand. I can start with a square and it has four rotational symmetries. I can rotate by 90 degrees. I can rotate by 180, 270, or 360. I can just add a side to the square to get a, a pentagon, and it has one more rotation. And I can keep going ad infinitum. So I build a family of symmetry groups in that way. I can also go up in dimension. I can take my square, and I can turn it into a cube. Now, a cube has more symmetries than a square. And I can keep adding, going up in dimensions as well. So this gives us an intuition of why we'd have these families of groups. Um, but in addition to these families, we also have 26 loners that are called the sporadic groups. These are 26 groups that just sit on their own. They're isolated. They have no friends. They don't belong to any particular tribe. The largest of these goes by the name of the monster group. Uh, for good reason. The number of elements, the number of symmetry operations contained in the monster group, um, it, which I've displayed in the center of the uh, slide here, is greater than the number of atoms on Earth and stars in the universe. Now, I, I, I find it uh, marvelous that we could get a handle on something so monstrous, uh, uh, so enormous, something so incomprehensibly large, but we understand it exactly precisely. And just to hammer home how bizarre this is, you could think of it as being the symmetries of a 196,883 dimensional cube. Now at this point, you'd be forgiven for saying, this, this is rubbish, what are you talking about? It's completely crazy, but it's solid mathematics. And what is more, its discovery has led to whole new branches of mathematics. It has had implications for physics and for modern technology, which really demonstrates now, asking simple, good questions can lead to wonderful new avenues. We started from the humble uh, set of axioms of a group, considering the symmetries of a triangle, and we've landed up in this 196,000 dimensional world with applications to cryptography and communications and initiations of whole new avenues of research. I really like this idea. But that's not the end of the story of the classification of groups. Although the monster group has an absolutely huge number of elements, it's still finite. It's still a finite, you could count them. It would take you forever, but you could count them. There are also groups that are known as Lie groups that have an infinite number of elements. These are continuous symmetry groups and they were pioneered principally by Lee and Cartan and there's some pictures of them here. Now, these are actually not so hard to grasp. We can start again with the triangle, and we know we can rotate it by 120 degrees. And as I said before, we can add a side to get a square, which we can rotate by 90 degrees, or 180, or 270, or 360. We can add another side to get a pentagon, and another to get a hexagon, and so on and so on. And as we keep adding sides, we get closer and closer to a circle. And if we think about taking the limit of an infinite number of sides, we land on a circle. Now, a circle looks the same if you rotate it by any angle at all. So it has an infinite number of symmetries, but it's a kind of boring infinite number of symmetries because we only need one number to describe that infinite number of symmetries, the angle of rotation. This is in the same way as if you take a map, there, there are an infinite number of points on the map but you only need two coordinates, you only need two numbers to describe where that infinite number of points are. We say that this is a one-dimensional symmetry group. 
And again, we can classify all finite dimensional Lie groups. Uh, and it's very simple. We've got, first of all, we've got to get, we've again got three families of groups. These go by the name of special orthogonal, special unitary, and symplectic. And here again, I'm talking about the building blocks of these finite dimensional groups, the, the indivisible uh, uh, atoms of Lie groups. Now, the special orthogonal groups are these rotations I was talking about. So uh, SO2 is rotations in two dimensions. That's just rotations in the plane, uh, or rotations of the circle, if you like. Now, SO3 on the other hand, these rotations in a three-dimensional space. I can rotate the circle by one, uh, in, in one dimension, but I can rotate a ball around three different axes. So it's a three-dimensional group. And admittedly, SO4, rotations of a four-dimensional ball, becomes a little hard to envisage, but you kind of get the idea. And mathematically, it's really no problem. And I'm gonna claim later that the special unitary and symplectic groups are exactly the same kind of idea. They're all rotation. But just as for the finite simple groups, uh, which have these loners, the sporadic groups, again, the uh, continuous Lie groups also have some loners, the exceptional Lie group. Um, in this case, there are only five of them, and they go by the unillumin unilluminating names of G2, F4, E6, E7, and E8. And they're kind of geometrically enigmatic. They're not really rotations of anything that we could be familiar with. Or are they? And so I'm going to come back to that point. But before I do, I want to discuss the role of Lie groups in physics and the laws of nature. Now, we learn in school of the conservation of momentum. And we have an intuition for, for it for our, in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, from playing tennis to playing football, playing pool, snooker, they're all good examples of the conservation of momentum at play. Um, but did you ever ask yourself, where does that conservation of momentum come from? Why should it be that momentum is conserved? Now, a brilliant mathematician, Emmy Noether, picture of her on the right, uh, made, a made an outstanding contribution to physics as well by telling us that whenever the laws of nature have a symmetry, this implies a conservation law. So for example, it is the translation symmetry of the laws of physics in space that implies the conservation of the momentum. And the translation of the laws of physics in time implies the conservation of energy. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is quite literally, if I, if I do an experiment on my desk over here, and then I just shift the experiment over to this side of the desk, uh, the result should be the same as long as I'm not monkeying around with the external forces too much. And it shouldn't matter which spot on the desk I did my experiment. And the same is true with time. I can translate in time. If I uh, count the period, if I time the period of a pendulum swinging, it shouldn't matter if I did that on Monday or Tuesday, assuming all the external forces on Monday and Tuesday are the same. And this leads to the conservation of energy. And rotations in, th in 3D space lead to the conservation of angular momentum, which is beautifully illustrated by this ice skater. And we can take this even further. You can actually think of Einstein's special theory of relativity as being the statement that the laws of nature are left invariant by rotations in space and time. And it turns out that, the, 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 that quantum theory is also invariant under symmetry groups. In this case, the unitary groups, S, or special unitary groups, which are called SUN. And you can think of these as rotations in complex space. Now, what do I mean by rotations in complex space? I mean, those words are just gobbledygook at the moment. And this takes us to the second part of our discussion, the algebra of symmetries. I want to put the idea of number and symmetry together. To do this, we have to quickly introduce the notion of complex numbers and their connection to rotations. So what do I mean by a complex number? Well, at school, we learn that a positive number times a positive number is a positive number. And a negative number times a negative number is also a positive number. So the square of all numbers is positive. 
And therefore, the negative numbers have no square root. The square root of minus one, we are taught, doesn't exist. But this is just a lack of imagination. We can add in the square root of minus one to our number system. And we do this by, uh, and we, we call the square root of uh, minus one i. And then we can think of the complex numbers, which have some amount of our everyday uh, vanilla real numbers, in this example, six. Uh, but they also have an imaginary component, some amount of the square root of minus one. And in this case, I've, I've picked nine. So we can have a complex number has two components. It has a real component, which is just an ordinary number, and an imaginary component, which is an ordinary number times by i. Now this sounds pretty uh, out there, but it's actually not so hard to understand. You can just think of uh, these numbers as living on a two-dimensional plane, where one axis of this plane are the real numbers, the everyday numbers, six, seven, pi, square root of two, and the imaginary numbers, which go along the other axis. So our complex number z can be just represented as a point on this plane, as I've done in this diagram here. Now, something I want to say about multiplication of complex numbers, I'm not going to describe it, but just to tell you that multiplication of complex numbers is commutative, just like the multiplication of ordinary numbers. Four times six is the same as six times four. They're both 24. And the same is true for complex numbers. Z times W is the same as W times Z. Now, the other thing I want to tell you about complex numbers is that if I take a complex number that has unit length, its magnitude is one, and I times it, any other complex number by that number, let's say Z, I times it by a unit length number, it rotates Z in the plane, and I've illustrated this in the diagram. So if I times Z by I, it gets rotated by 90 degrees around the circle. If I times it by i again, it gets rotated by another 90 degrees. Multiplication by unit length complex numbers is the same as rotations in the plane. It is our group, SO2. And this finally brings us to Hamilton. Hamilton was asking himself if, uh, if complex multiplication is related to rotations in a two-dimensional space. Is there some new number system that does the same for rotations in a three-dimensional space? Now, this challenge plagued Hamilton for a long time, and he really struggled with it, as he describes in a letter to his son. He says, every morning in the early part of the above-cited month, on coming down to breakfast, your then little brother, William Edwin, and yourself used to ask me, well, Papa, can you multiply triples? Whereto I was always obliged to reply with a sad shake of the head. No, I can only add and subtract them. Now, I think the thing we learned from this is that Hampton's kids were pretty annoying. But the other thing uh, we learned, oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. But of course, Hamilton uh, overcame this problem, otherwise I wouldn't be telling you. Uh, in a moment of epiphany, famously, he was walking from the Dunsink Observatory to a meeting of the uh, Irish Royal Academy of Science on Dawson Street, when it occurred to him what he needed to do, and as he described it, I then and there felt the galvanic circuit of four clothes, and the sparks which fell from it were exactly the fundamental equations between I, J, and K exactly as I've used them ever since. Now the I here that I'm talking about is just the I we met from the complex numbers. So what are J and K? Where did they come from? Well, they're just like I. They're more of the same. They both square to minus one. But Hamilton's brilliant insight was to identify that there should be a relationship between the three. I times J times K is minus one. And here we see why Hamilton struggled for so long in trying to find the analog in three dimensions. The thing he was looking for are necessarily four dimensional. We've got the original real numbers plus three imaginary axes, i, j, and k. And these 
are the four dimensional quaternions, which are denoted H for Hamilton, although I've never actually looked that up. Um, uh, and they are, they were an incredibly beautiful uh, addition to mathematics, certainly deserving of a visit to uh, Broom Bridge in Canberra. And I've included a photo of myself and my PhD supervisor paying due homage to Hamilton um, underneath the plaque commemorating Hamilton's discovery. Now, at this point, I want to stress that while the complex numbers were commutative, it didn't matter what order you multiplied them in, just like the ordinary real numbers, the quaternions are not commutative. The order in which you multiply things can matter. For example, i times j equals k, but j times i is minus k. So what do we have? Let's, let's, uh, let's consolidate. We've got the vanilla familiar real numbers, one, two, three, pi, a half, two thirds, and so on. Then we added to those the imaginary unit i, the square root of minus one, to get the complex numbers. And then we added to the complex numbers two further imaginary units, j and k, to get the quaternions. And at this stage, you might wonder, can we just keep going and adding more and more units? And this is exactly what Hamilton's friend, uh, John Graves, asked him in a letter um, in that same year. He writes, there is still something in the system, here he's talking about the quaternions, which gravels me. I have not yet any clear views as to the extent to which we are at liberty to arbitrarily create imaginaries and to endow them with supernatural properties. If with your alchemy you can pay, make three pounds of gold, IJK, why should you stop there? And indeed, Graves discovered that you don't have to stop there. You can add another four imaginary units, uh, giving you an eight dimensional type of number called the octonian. Now, in each, you'll notice here, we doubled the number of uh, units that we had. So for the reals, we had the unit that was one. And for the complexes, we had one and i, which I've relabeled as E1. And then we, for the quaternions, we had one, i, j, and k, which I've relabeled E1, 2, and 4. And for the octonians, we've got, we've got a total of eight, one and E1 through seven. We double each case, double in each case. This process is known as Cayley Dixon doubling, but it doesn't come for free. Every time we double, we have to pay a price. We lose a property. So the real numbers are ordered. I can always tell you when one real number is more or less than another. Two is less than three, but it is greater than minus one. And they're all ordered along the real axis. But because the complex numbers have two axes, the real axis and the imaginary axis, it's not necessarily you can't really say when one complex number is more than another. You can just talk about their magnitudes being greater. So when we double to the complexes, we, use the, we lose the ordered property. Now, when we doubled from the uh, complexes to the quaternions, we already saw that we lost commutativity. For the quaternions, it mattered what order we multiply things. When we double again to the octonions, we lose another property, associativity. John Byers, uh, an expert on the Octonian, summarized the situation as this. The real numbers are the dependable breadwinner of the family, the complete ordered field we all rely on. The complex numbers are a slightly flashier but still respectable younger brother, not ordered, but algebraically complete. The quaternions, being non-commutative, are the eccentric cousin who is shunned at important family gatherings. But the Octonians are the crazy old uncle that nobody lets out of the attic. They're non-associative. So you could, you could ask, can we keep going? Well, what I'm trying to get at here is that no, you can't. Because their numbers become crazier and crazier with each doubling, it ends here. And you can prove that these are the only, what we call in the technical parlance, norm division algebras, which is just a mathematical code for numbers as we kind of know them. We can double again, but then it stops really being a number in the usual sense. Okay, so now let's get back to symmetry. I don't know if you recall, but I claimed earlier 
that the three infinite families of Lie group were all rarely rotations. Now I can tell you what I mean by that. The special orthogonal groups, SOM, were rotations in real spaces. Um, SUN are rotations in complex spaces, and SPN are rotations in quaternionic spaces. Now at this point, you must be asking, what about the octonians? Where do they fit into this? They must have something to do with the missing exceptional Lie groups, uh, G2, E6, E7, E8, and F4. And indeed, they do. The symmetries of the octonians give you these exceptional Lie groups. And in this, and in this sense, all of the Lie groups, including the exceptional ones, are really rotations, but they're rotations in real, complex, quaternionic, and octonionic universes. It's an amazing discovery, but it gives a nice unified picture to what these Lie groups are. Okay, so now we're on to the final part uh, of the lecture. We get back to some physics. And I want to deal with the problem of quantum gravity. But before that, I, can tell, I have to tell you what that is. So the two pillars of 20th century physics, the quantum theory, which describes the elementary particles and their basic inter interactions, excluding the force of gravity, which is described by Einstein's theory of general relativity. Um, which beautifully describes the large scale structures that we see from planetary orbits to the evolution of the entire universe itself. Now, in the quantum picture of forces, which is described by the standard model of particle physics, we can think of forces as being the exchange of quanta of particles. So in this, in this um, diagram, I have what are called the fermions, which are the matter particles, the particles that make up our stuff. These are the purple and green uh, squares. So in the purple squares, for example, I've got the up and down quarks, which are bound together to make the protons and neutrons that sit inside our nuclei of our atoms. And around these nuclei are orbiting the electrons in the green square. Now, all of these particles talk to each other. They interact by exchanging what are called the bosons. These are particles of force. The most famous one is the photon, which is the force particle of electromagnetism, it, it, it gives us light. The gluons, for example, are the force particle of the strong force that holds together the quarks in the protons and neutrons. And we can picture these using, we can picture these interactions using Feynman diagrams, and there's an example here. So you can imagine particles bumping off of each other, exchanging in between these force particles, the gluons and photons. And I can't help but point out that the standard model of particle physics, which is really, uh, it's really our most precise description of nature, tremendously powerful and accurate theory, is underpinned by three symmetry groups, SU3, SU2, and U1. Just throw that out there. Conspicuously absent from this slide is the force of gravity. Now the standard model plays out on, the, on a background stage of space and time. Whilst gravity, Einstein taught us, is really an artifact of the curvature of space-time. Gravity is the stage itself, which is promoted from mere background to one of the main protagonists. And I can't help but say that, again, there is an infinite dimensional symmetry group lurking in the background of all of this. This picture of uh, gravity as the curvature of space-time is incredibly beautiful and geometric. And amazingly, more than 100 years after its prediction, the ripples in space-time uh, predicted, uh, were detected, the ripples in space-time caused by colliding black holes were detected by the LIGO and VOGO experiments. It's a tremendous achievement of uh, science and mathematics. Now, these two slides were intentionally very separate, the standard model slide and the GR slide, because it seems naively that general relativity is incompatible with quantum theory. So if one tries to apply the quantum rules that we used in the standard model to describe the electromagnetic force and the strong force and so on, one tries to apply that to gravity, it spits out junk. Our equations just give us uncontrollable infinities and it seems like things break down. 
On the other hand, general relativity predicts the existence of black holes and Stephen Hawking famously discovered that these black holes emit quantum radiation. And the, this, the implications of this actually challenge the very foundations of quantum theory. So general relativity is a problem for quantum theory and quantum theory is a problem for general relativity. And without a consistent theory of quantum gravity, these conundrums cannot be resolved and our picture of nature remains fundamentally fractured. The solution augurs the next scientific revolution in, in theoretical physics. And it remains an open question today, despite many promising proposals with fancy names like loop quantum gravity and causal set theory and asymptotic freedom. But it really is an open question and anyone who makes a definitive statement about the status of quantum gravity has a hidden agenda. Now, the particular uh, approach to the problem of quantum gravity that I want to discuss today in the remaining uh, 10 minutes or so is that of M theory because it connects to the work of uh, Hamilton and Graves. To do this, I need to introduce another notion of symmetry. This is called supersymmetry. I described earlier that the world is kind of split into the matter particles, the fermions, and the force particles that make them interact, the bosons. Supersymmetry says that really there is a symmetry that interchanges these two worlds. To every boson, there is a corresponding fermion, and to every fermion, there is a corresponding boson. I should stress at this stage, supersymmetry is not known to be a symmetry of nature. Um, although we are searching for it at experiments like the Large Hadron Collider, nothing has come up yet. Now, if we add in this idea of supersymmetry to Einstein's general theory of relativity, we, we land on something called supergravity, the supersymmetric extension of Einstein's general theory of relativity, invented by these chaps on the right. And one of the reasons people were interested in this is that supersymmetry tames the kinds of infinities that I was discussing when we tried to quantize gravity. And this led people in the early 80s to be optimistic that supergravity could be the answer to the problem of quantum gravity. In fact, uh, in Hawking's inaugural lecture, Is the End in Sight for Theoretical Physics, he speculated that N equals 8 supergravity may be a candidate. But as everyone knows, if you present a talk claiming that the end, in sight, the end is in sight for something, it most definitely is not. Supergravity diverges, uh, quantum supergravity diverges just as quantum Einstein gravity diverged. Okay. Is that the end of the road? Well, not quite. In parallel developments that were happening along, alongside these, people were looking to a theory of strings for uh, a quantum theory of gravity. Now, what is the idea behind string theory? In the standard model of particle physics, we really think of point particles colliding off of each other. And the idea of string theory is that really, if we zoom in on these point particles close enough, they're not really point particles, they're really strings. Uh, that are oscillating and vibrating. And these Feynman diagrams describing the collisions of point particles get smoothed out into these tube-like uh, diagrams. What was remarkable, remarkable about string theory is that it automatically included the quantum particles of gravity, which are called gravitons. Could this be a theory of quantum gravitons that is, doesn't have infinity? Well, it turned out that for quantum mechanical consistency, string theory requires a certain number of what you might say are surprises. First of all, it has to be supersymmetric. I remind you, we've not seen supersymmetry in nature. Second of all, it means that space-time has to have type 10 dimensions. It predicts that the, space, that the real dimension of space and time is 10. We, we only see four, we have one time and three space. And really to account for these extra six, we have to, well, one way of accounting for them is to consider them to be wrapped up. Uh, we call this compactified. And it seemed like these compactifications could account for the physics of the standard model. And the final thing I want to mention is that at low energies, strings, uh, closed superstrings, 
look like supergravity. So you can imagine taking a string and if you zoom away from it, and it gets further and further. Eventually, it just looks like a point particle and you land back on supergravity. So there was a connection between strings and supergravity from the outset. Okay, so I, I quickly skipped over the idea of compactification. And really, this idea predates string theory. In fact, uh, Fyodor Kaluza and Oscar Klein in the 1920s had already considered this in the context of general relativity. They said, what if the real world was really five dimensional and there was only gravity, but one of the dimensions was tightly curled up like a circle? Uh, one way of visualizing this is to think of a tightrope walker. Now, a tightrope walker can only go backwards and forwards along the tightrope. He's constrained to one dimension. But an ant that's much smaller can see the, uh, the spatial extent of the tightrope and can go around the circle. So to the ant, the world looks two-dimensional, while to the tightrope walker, it looks one-dimensional. So their idea was really, if one of the, if the fifth dimension was very small and we just couldn't see it, uh, then, then that would account for the fact that we don't see all five dimensions. But what's more, if you plug in Einstein's equations into this picture, you get out gravity plus electromagnetism plus a scalar field that nobody ordered, one extra force. Um, so it seemed like, to Kaluza and Klein, that you could unify the force of gravity with the force of electromagnetism by going up in one dimension. Now, people were rightly excited in the 1980s about superstrings. Uh, it seemed a promising route to try, but at the same time, there were questions. The first question one might ask, and people did ask, was if you allow point particles to become strings, why not membranes, sheets floating from space, or higher dimensional membranes, which we call three brains or four brains and so on? The second question was that it seemed like there were uh, five different superstring theories. Uh, these are illuminatingly named type one, type 2a, 2b, heterotico, and heterotic e, that doesn't matter. But there were five different string theories. Which one is the right one? Why should there be, if this is the theory of everything, why should there be five of them? Another problem that came up was what's referred to as the landscape problem. It seems like there are 10, at least 10 to 272,000 different ways of wrapping up the extra dimensions. Now that number is unimaginably huge. It dwarfs things like the number of particles in the universe. Which one is the correct way to wrap up the dimension? Uh, another question that arose was that it seemed that supersymmetry alone allowed up to 11 space-time dimensions. But then why did strings stop at 10? In fact, this was a discovery of the director of the School of Theoretical Physics, Werner Nam. If supersymmetry allows 10, why do string, uh, allows 11, why do strings stop at 10? Similarly, the theory of supergravity is actually unique in 11 dimensions and takes its most elegant and simple form. Us theoretical physicists like uniqueness and simplicity. So it seems like there should be a role for 11 dimensions in all of this. Well, in the mid 90s, Edward Witten made a remarkable uh, claim that was building on a collection of work that was preceded from the mid 80s to the mid 90s by uh, a whole host of researchers that I can't possibly do justice to. I've listed some of the names at the bottom. But the claim was that these five string theories and 11 dimensional supergravity were really just corners for much bigger framework, which he enigmatically dubbed M theory. You can think about this as like a zoologist that's blindfolded and encounters an elephant for the first time. He can grope around and feel the tail, grope around and feel the trunk, grab an ear or a leg, uh, just getting kind of feels for patches of what the elephant is without knowing the totality. That's kind of how M theory came to us. Uh, to give an example of some of the clues, one of them was that the 11 dimensional supergravity does indeed have membranes. So, in addition to strings, could there be membranes? And this, uh, this underpins the, the name M theory, which Edward Witten said could stand for magic, mystery, or membrane, according to your taste. 
Now, you can see how these membranes could get related to strings. If you take it, if you take a sheet uh, and you uh, wrap it, you take a membrane and you wrap it around a piece of paper, and then you curl up that paper into a circle and then you take it very far away. It now, that membrane now looks like a string. And the claim is that if you compactify a membrane on a circle, you get out a string. In fact, you get the type 2A superstring. And the, and these membranes became fundamental constituents of M theory. And in fact, brains more generally became a ubiquitous part of string theory. Now this connection between the 11 dimensional membranes and the 10 dimensional strings forms one, one um, part of what we call a web of dualities. We have all these different corners of M theory, the different string theories. And in fact, they're all related to each other and we can jump from one to another using dualities. The reason we can't say what M theory is in totality is that it's what we call non-perturbative. Uh, normally, as physicists, we like to apply uh, the mathematics of perturbation theory. Here, we're not allowed to do that. And for this reason, we can only really get glimpses of M theory, a corner here, a little snapshot there. But all of these corners and snapshots can be connected together by these dualities. These dualities bring me to my final slide. It was already known prior to the uh, 80s that N equals 8 supergravity has an E7 symmetry, one of these exceptional Lie groups that required the Octonians to understand. And it turns out that this web of dualities that connect up the different facets of M theory that we know about have exactly these exceptional Lie groups underpinning them. So M theory compactified down to four dimensions has a, has a duality group that is E7. Hamilton's quaternions and Graves' octonions are hiding in M theory, one of the approaches to unifying fundamental physics. And I'll, I'll, end, this, I'll end the talk there. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Liron. That was great. Um... Just kind of, the, the, I, I really loved all your slides and everything. Um, just, I have a quick question. Um, can you tell us about other approaches to uh, quantum gravity or is M theory testable? Well, yes, I mean, this is, this, this, these two questions are, are closely related. Um, there are definitely, as I mentioned, uh, other approaches to quantum gravity that people are exploring because this, is, this remains a, a challenge for 21st century physics. So I've listed a few here. Uh, one of the other leading uh, candidates is uh, what's called loop quantum gravity, which takes a different point of view. And it doesn't use strings as its starting point. Another one that I particularly like personally is that of causal set theory. Um, the idea behind causal set theory is to really say that, you know, we, we have this, in general relativity, we think of space and time as being this kind of continuous, smooth fabric. It's like a fluid. Uh, I want to use the analogy of water. Water is a smooth flowing fluid. But we know that water, when you get down to it, is really molecular. There are uh, molecules of water bumping off of each other. And this smoothness, it's just, a, it's just an artifact of us zooming far out. Now, the causal set approach to quantum gravity postulates that space-time is much the same, that there are atoms or molecules of space and time. Um, and this, the, the, the reason why you might think that this is uh, promising is that by having this granularity, it might resolve uh, this problem of infinities. It basically means that you can think of these infinities as being able to zoom in on space and time indefinitely. Now in string theory, the reason why the, the infinities get resolved is because you, you don't zoom in indefinitely. As you zoom in further and further, you find that there are these strings that have finite length. Now in causal sets, something it's, a, it's analogous, but it's different. You zoom in further and further and you realize that space and time are not continuous. They're actually granular and you have to stop zooming in. There's a fundamental limit to how far you can zoom in before you meet the atoms of space and time, which has the, it gives this intuition of being able to solve 
these divergences that come up in the problem of quantum gravity. Um, now, the testability of M theory, uh, well, it, I, I would say, that, you know, we don't, the, the most conservative thing to say is, is we actually don't know what M theory is. I've told you that we can really just get glimpses of, this, of these different corners. We know it looks like type 2a string theory here. We know it looks like 11 dimensional supergravity here. But actually, no one today has managed to say what M theory itself really is. And this is an active research program. Until we do that, it would be premature to make any claims about predictions. Even for strings, it's very difficult to say something. Now, uh, you might hear a claim that strings make no predictions at all. And with some contortions, you can make this statement true. It's not really true. Strings really do make predictions. It's just that they are untestable with our current technological capabilities. If you could uh, fire strings at each other uh, hard enough, they would have scattering properties that, uh, that are particular to strings, i.e. if you did these experiments and you didn't see these particular scattering properties of strings, then you could rule out string theory and it, it would be dead as a theory. But the energies that you have to go to are just completely off the scale. There, there is no hope of building a, a particle accelerator that could do that kind of experiment. So for the time being, string theory remains untestable. But it's for a different reason. It, it, it's, it's not that it's in principle untestable. It's still a scientific theory. It's just that we don't have anything like the technology that we'd uh, need to do to test those kind of predictions. Now, what one would really hope is that we can make other predictions with string theory that are testable in the laboratory today. And those have remained elusive. Those don't exist. So in that sense, it's not yet testable. Okay, thanks a million. Liam is wondering if you have any recommendation, recommendations for further reading. Um, yes, uh, so I mean there are, there are there are lots of excellent books out there. Um, it depends exactly what you would like to uh, to get a taste of. Now, if you wanted the uh, the mathematics of symmetry, um, trying to think of a particularly good book in that case that's not too technical. Um, Okay, maybe I'll, I'll come back to that one. So it, 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 for, for, the, for the questions of quantum gravity, there are lots of good popular books. There's the, there's the book by um, uh, Brian Greene, The Elegant Universe. Uh, and that's, that's really a book about uh, the problem of quantum gravity through the eyes of the string theorist or an M theorist. Um, as an alternative, uh, something that also something that I'd really like to recommend is Leonard Susskind's uh, series, uh, the theoretical minimal a uh, minimum. These are really great books because, so you, I mean there there are plenty of popularizations of these books. So you could take, for instance, the Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. That's another great account. But they're very uh, they're, they're very on the surface and really they don't give you the kind of idea of how these things really work. Leonard Susskind has made a, a genuine effort to kind of give you the minimum. That you need to really be able to understand this stuff. So I, Leonard Susskind's books, um, The Theoretical Minimum, I, I strongly recommend if you're a little more serious about it. But if you just want to enjoy it as a kind of casual hobby, Brief History of Time is great. Um, the Elegant Universe is great. Um, I like the books by John Gribben on uh, quantum theory. They're nice. And um, anything by Roger Penrose, I also very much enjoy. And he gives you another side of the, the the argument to the kind of string theory m theory argument presented in um in in the elegant universe um yeah i'd, I'd recommend any of those great thanks a million um everybody you have another kind of five or ten minutes to add some questions to the chat bar or you can unmute your microphone and ask me on directly um while you're all thinking of that, I just want to say many thanks to Liron for today's lecture um, and to say, well, that, that's it for the lockdown uh, lecture series. So we close out on something that is very interesting. Uh, and even I understood part of it, you'd be glad to hear Liron. <laughs> Good. Um, that was not my intention. Nobody was meant to understand anything. So. <laughs> I didn't say everything, just, you know, part of it. <laughs> um, um, 
where are we now? Oh yes, um, I want to say many thanks to all of you who have attended, uh, obviously making this series a success and we hope to see you at some of our future events going forward. Now speaking of future events, we do have a number of events taking place next week between the 16th and the 19th of June. Uh, this week marks the actual anniversary of DIAS um, with the Institute Act was signed initially on the 19th of June in 1940. Um, so we two of our major events that are taking place, one is taking place on Monday the 15th of June at 6 p.m. and it's going to be led by RTE journalist and historian David McCullough. He will chair a panel discussion which will delve into the history of uh, Deb Lera, who some of you might know was actually the driving force behind the establishment of the Institute. Um, there is a number of other uh, people on the panel as well, so it should prove to be a very interesting discussion. So that's at 6 p.m. on the 15th of June, and I will um, add the Eventbrite link for registration uh, into the chat bar very, very, very shortly. The second event that we have is actually on the 19th of June itself, again, that being the, the day the Act was signed. Um, and we are delighted to uh, announce that the Dias Day Lecture um, will be presented uh, by Nobel Laureate uh, Professor Gerard de Hooft. I might have, uh, I should pronounce that totally wrong. Um, and he's going to present a lecture uh, called Black Holes and How They Might Be uh, Sources of New Physics. So that is Friday, the 19th of June at 5 pm. And I will once again, I will put the Eventbrite link into the chat bar uh, for anybody who might want to register for that. Um, so while I have been uh, waffling on about our upcoming events, uh, Leo Enright has a question for you later on. He first of all says bravo, uh, and he said this was by far the most accessible description I've ever seen and should be widely shared. We plan to, Leo, we will be putting this, uh, th this video up to YouTube. Uh, he has a question which is slightly off topic. With your wonderful way of explaining, can you describe how we use quaternions to navigate to Mars? I'm sorry, can you repeat the last part again? Sure. Um, he is wondering, can you describe how we use quaternions to navigate to Mars? Ah, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure I can rise to that challenge. In, in more than a superficial way. But first of all, thank you for the compliment. That, that I appreciate that. Um, that's an interesting question. Now, the, the, I, the, the, the superficial thing I can say is that uh, quaternions um, describe three-dimensional space. I mean, that's where Hamilton started out. He wanted to understand how the symmetries of three-dimensional space are encoded in some number system and he found in doing this the quaternions and um, so we can really talk about now now why is this important to navigating to why could this be important to navigating to mars well if you imagine the computer systems you you, you have some uh, that need to guide your uh, interplanetary ship these computer systems need to keep a track of the orientations um, of your ship in a three-dimensional space. And they will do this with, through uh, some algorithms in their computer. And one of the nice ways of encoding these algorithms is precisely through the quaternions. So you can think of a, as, a, as, a, as a computer scientist trying to um, write uh, efficient code for um, uh, software to keep a track of your spaceship as it hurtles through space. And you could use the Quaternions to uh, implement um, those algorithms. So it's a, you could think of it as a mathematical framework for describing how your spaceship would fly through space. Um, I don't know, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on uh, planetary or rocket science so I you know I really uh, there, there could be more to it than that there, there could be stuff that I'm overlooking but at the very least that's the kind of uh, superficial thing I, I might I might put forward as an application of the quaternions I mean more generally the quaternions are used in computer software I mean every time uh, well not every time but they can be used uh, for rendering uh, 3d universes in, in in computer programs so if you're playing 
computer game that lives in some kind of 3D virtual world, there are quaternions lurking in the background of those computer programs. So it's a nice example of uh, Hamilton's work entering in, in, in the modern world. Great. Uh, the next question is from Liam again. He is wondering, is it arrogant to assume nature should have any mathematical foundation at all? Or is it all just a closer approximation to a reality we can never describe? I think that's a, that's a, a difficult question. Uh, it's not unreasonable to ask. I mean, one way of putting it, Hermann Weyl, a great mathematician and physicist, who was beating about at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, put it this way. He, he described it as the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Why should mathematics be so good at describing the world around us? Who, who, who gave mathematics that right? Um, it seems to be. Now, I think the problem that I have with this question is, it, 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 is that science isn't just a body of knowledge. It's a methodology. It's a way of coming to understand the world. So when a scientist does science, it's just as much about how we come to acquire knowledge as the knowledge itself. So what I want to be true is I want to, you know, the way that science works is that I, I postulate a hypothesis. I have to articulate some uh, consequences of that hypothesis that I can put to test. I can put a test in the laboratory. And that's the way we come to understand the world in, in the scientific point of view. Now, to be able to do that, I need something like mathematics to get the story going, right? I, let's say um, I'm Newton and I come up with my law of gravitation. And I say, the law of gravitation, I use some mathematics and it says the orbits should be able to go, uh, the orbits of the planet should go like this. Now to do those experiments, I need to be able to measure distances. That needs numbers. I need those notions. I need, you know, right in there, I need, when I talk about testing my hypotheses, I need to be able to make measurements and measurements come down to using numbers. Um, so in that sense, I think uh, that would be one justification of, of using uh, mathematics. It's just to say, to get the, to get the game going, I need, I need, to have something I can hold on to. Now, it could be that this is all an illusion. Uh, I mean, that's not a logical impossibility. But I think what we've learned over the centuries, that this methodology, this way of coming to understand the world around us, is incredibly powerful. And it has taken us further, quicker than uh, our prior uh, modes of understanding so you know there was this there was this kind of um greek uh, you know the, the ancient greeks kind of had this sense that you could derive uh properties of the world through pure reason reason alone um and uh and aristotle really bucked that trend by saying well no actually uh you know we need to add in some experiment and democritus and those and i think that addition of experiment is incredibly powerful and it takes you much further um, in our understanding than anything has taken us before. So it does seem incredibly effective, but you know, that's not, a, that's not a, 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 an argument to say that in the end we may fail. I just think it would be desperately uh, pessimistic to take that attitude. It's been it's been so wonderfully illuminating to date. We've discovered so many fascinating things um, that it seems uh, it would seem childish to dismiss it on the possibility uh, that that really, in the end, things are going to break down into uh, something that we can't even understand. On the other hand, I wouldn't even know how to describe that. I wouldn't know uh, what does it mean for um, reality to not correspond correspond to any kind of uh order i mean it's just that it's a very difficult notion to get one's head around so for me it's about the the mode of understanding how we come to understand that's so important i, I love the idea of discovering stuff about the world through this this these testable experiments that we can repeat and really come to grips with our understanding that way rather than postulating things to be true um 
I, what's also another thing that I just love about this story is that it's so much more mysterious than our own imagination. We, we you know, we, we, whatever, whatever things you, you might come up with um, writing science fiction, say, the science fact always seems to trump it. Quantum theory itself is so counterintuitive. It's almost, uh, I mean, you know, it, it, Einstein famously rejected quantum theory. He said this can't be, he, I mean, it, not, not rejected it in the sense that he said it made wrong predictions. It, it definitely made right predictions. He said this can't be the end of the line. There must be something that replaces quantum theory because it's too weird. It's too wonderful. Um, but that's great, isn't it? That, you know, that you just, you just do this rigorous, hard experimentation backed up by mathematics and you uncover worlds that are beyond imagination. You know, they're, they are, they are weirder than Star Trek, more wonderful than Star Wars. I really like that. That's a, so for me, I don't want to give up in science. <laughs> that, that, okay, I'll shut up. That was quite long. <laughs> no, I, I like the way you referred to it as a story. Uh, and I suppose the mathematical tool is, uh, as Liam has said, he says, uh, it's a fair answer. Thank you. Uh, we, we have no better tool at the moment to measure, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so finally, our final question is again from SK, and he, uh, he or she is wondering, is time special in space-time or just the same as the other three? And if it is, is time special in the higher dimensions or are there multiple time dimensions? Oh, that's, that's a, a brilliant set of questions. That's great. <laughs> that makes me feel like uh, it was worthwhile discussing uh, uh, the, the, the space and time and uh, symmetries. That's good. Um, so th there are th the answers are never simple. Now, on the one hand, I want to say no. Space and time uh, are are unified. This is true. Uh, what Einstein's special theory of relativity tells us is that we can uh, just as just in the same way as I can take a uh, a, a map of Dublin and I can rotate the coordinates of this map into each other. So I can take the X and Y axis and I can rotate it around to some other axes, but it doesn't change where things are in Dublin. It just changes how I've described the map. I can actually do the same with space and time. I can rotate time into space and space into time. Now thought of that way, no, there's really no difference between uh, space and time, but that's not the end of the story. Time is special because the type of rotations I, I don't know. Let me go back to a slide so I can I can point to an equation, not an equation, but uh, some notation. Um, when I mentioned, yeah, on this on this page, uh, I mentioned in passing that rotations in space and time uh, uh, capture the essence of special relativity. And you here you see that I've got one time, and and the and the and the symmetry group is S of one comma three. The three is the three space-time dimensions and the one is the one-time dimension. And that comma does distinguish time. Um, and it's very important. If that, if that comma wasn't there, then we would have no, there would be no, uh, there'd be no causal order to the events that happen in the world. So it, it, it's probably wrong to say that, that, uh, that time is special, but what is special is the causal ordering of events. And uh, this is a, this is a, yeah. So another way of talking about Einstein's special theory of relativity is to say that things that we, we call them, we, we call events that are time-like separated. Uh, sorry, um, time-like separated means that they have some causal, causal order. So me uh, starting this sentence causally precedes you hearing it. The, you know, that I kicked off the event and you hearing it is, a, is, a, is another event that is time-like related to me speaking those words. One causally preceded the other. Now, what Einstein taught us was that actually not everything is like that. Uh, simultaneity for, it, it is really, uh, really observer-dependent. Um, so if we take something happening uh, here uh, and something else happening in... Uh, let's say New York, and we say that they happened at the same time. If these things were not time-like separated to each other in the way I've just described, we wouldn't be able to say whether one happened before the other. It just doesn't make sense. 
And what I'm trying to say is that events in space and time are not all causally ordered to each other. Some are, and those are the ones that are kind of physically dependent on each other. So uh, the, yeah, so you just, you know, that, 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 that um, you uh, getting in your car, driving somewhere and getting out of the car, all of those events are causally ordered. They're all connected to each other by a causal chain. But some other event that seemingly happened at the same time as that over in um, Dallas, I don't know why I keep picking US cities, uh, happened in Dallas. It, to some people, it looked like it happened at the same time as you getting in the car. And to some other observers, it would look like uh, it, it happened at, before you got in the car. And so not everything in space time is causally ordered. Um, and that's what's really, uh, oh, this, that was a terrible description. <laughs> Yeah, so what's, what's important, what is, what is, what is uh, true for everyone is the causal ordering of things. But really you can mix time and space into each other. What I wanted to say was the fact that we have this causal ordering of events relies on the fact that there is this comma in this group, SO1, comma 3. And that really distinguishes the role of time. It's the, it's the thing that gives us the ability to causal order certain events. We can say that one thing happened before another, if they're time-like related. Um, now, the, the the symmetry group, SO1, comma three. One of the important things about it, if two events are causally ordered, one is time-like, one is time-like to the other. We call it time-like. One is causally ordered. Uh, then the symmetry rotations, these these rotations in space and time, cannot change that. They will always. Uh, maintain that causal ordering. If this happened before this, it doesn't matter what rotation I do, it will always be true that this happened before this. Now, if two things are not causally ordered, that they're, they're, they're what we call space-like separated, then depending on what, uh, how I rotate my map, how I rotate space and time into each other, I can actually change whether this one was before or after this one. Um, I cannot make them causally ordered by these rotations, so really this, this symmetry is really separating out those things that are causally ordered to each other from those things that have bear no causal relation to each other. It's separating out the universe in that way. And that one comma three is essential to that. So in that sense, time is important. It is separate from space. Higher dimensions. So yes, in everything I was talking about, what I really meant was that we always have one time dimension and we just add more and more space dimensions. There are theories, there are, uh, a hypothesis that add in extra time dimensions. Typically, these entail problems. The problems that are too technical to really be able to articulate in a, in a, in a quick, snappy way, but kind of problems of um, infinitely low energy, infinitely negative energy. So we could kind of, uh, you know, you, you, there's this idea of conservation of energy, but if you're allowed to lose energy, infinitely that, that things would be unstable all the time. It's, it's hard to explain more clearly than that quickly. Um, but they are useful nonetheless. And, and, and they're not, you know, it's not like people don't think about them because, well, I guess because the, the problems of physics are challenging and, uh, uh, and sometimes taking a wild leap leads you to some new fertile territory and adding in extra time dimensions. It's one of those wild leaps that people do consider. Definitely not a known fact about nature, though. Nature, as we understand it, has one time dimension. Uh, Liam is responding there, saying, for many years it was being assumed time was an emergent property driven by the second law of thermodynamics. I'm currently reading Lee Smolin, who makes mm. the case that time may be, in fact, fundamental. Have you any view or opinion? Um, I, I, I have lots of opinions and it depends on the context in which you ask them. I would say that the, that this question of emergence versus fundamental is, is, is open and it's really, it's driven, it's, we've really been driven to it by the property, by the conundrum of quantum gravity. And Lee Smolin is uh, not alone in making the case that time is fundamental. Um, but there are, and, and it's not, it's not, yeah, so th there are definitely practitioners that, that, that think it's most likely that time will be fundamental. And then there are those that really think that the whole of space-time will be emergent, that really this is, 
that this is some emergent property. And, and uh, so one way of saying this would be to say that quantum theory is really prior to, to space time and that we have this kind of timeless, spaceless world of quantum uh, states or quantum particles. And out of this spaceless and timeless world emerges space and time. In the same kind of way, I mean, this is not a good analogy. It's hard to come up with good analogies uh, without the mathematics, but it's in the same kind of way that you could think that really, uh, you know, your bar, a, a river, a river is really an emergent property. It's really the flowing of the river. What we see is something that um, is deeper down. It's about the bumping together of water molecules. It's emergent in that sense. Um, I've got to say, I, I, I just think the jury is out. And, you know, so the, 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 the approaches to quantum gravity that I spend my time thinking about predominantly are M theory and uh, causal set theory. Um, and in, in these cases, there are, there are senses in which time is fundamental um, uh, and it's senses in which it's emergent. Certainly, say, in causal sets, it would be emergent in the sense that uh, space-time events are atomistic and they're really, um, they, the, and what's really fundamental, I didn't say this about causal set theory, the reason it has the word causal in is that it, it, it postulates two things. First of all, space-time is built out of atoms of space and time. Um, these atoms you can think of as the events happening in space-time, a bang here, a pop there, me saying this, uh, a, a, you know, uh, a birthday, these are all, all these moments, these events in space and time are actually built up by these little atoms of space and time, these atomic events in space, in space time, atomic events of space time. Um, the other the thing I didn't say about this was that it's, it's the, it refers to the word causal. The other thing it says that these space time events are either causally, or causally ordered, you know, one happened before the other, or they're not, and, when, and then they just have no causal relationship to, to each other. Um, and that's this, that, that connects to this idea that I was trying to get up with causality and the special theory of relativity. Um, and it actually ties in with general relativity. So um, if you, it, but, but you can, so whether that's, whether that's a fundam, now whether time is fundamental in that picture is kind of up to your interpretation of it because here, it's when you, when you zoom out, uh, just as like you zoom out from the molecules in the water to a flowing river, and you, um, you zoom out from the atomistic picture of causal, underpinning causal set theory, to the smooth manifold, uh, it's called, it's the smooth space-time fabric of Einstein's general theory, theory of relativity. Whether you regard the time in, 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 in general relativity, the time dimension, as being emergent in that sense, uh, kind of depends on your point of view or whether you regard time as fundamental and what you mean by that is just that the things are either causally ordered or not causally ordered. I think causal order is somehow more primitive a notion than time itself. Um, I think uh, causal ordering is really a, a, a basic concept um, that is there in all our current theories. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on Lee Smolin's latest uh, latest projects and um, but I think even their causal order would be uh, it would, would be something that survives his picture. Uh, I'm going to stay on the fence. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> nice way to sum up there. Um, Liam responds saying it's interesting and he likes the idea of everything uh, is emergent and it's more about order of emergence and granularity. Um, so uh, I think we'll leave it there for today. We've gone over a little bit, um, which, you know, thankfully there was, there was nobody in the room uh, until 2.30. Uh, once again, uh, I want to thank all of our speakers over the course of the Lockdown Lecture Series who all volunteered their time. Uh, many thanks to Liron today for this uh, wonderful insight uh, into 11 dimensions. Um, and also, obviously, once again, many thanks to, to all who have attended, you know, obviously making, making this series a success. We do hope to see you at some of our future events. 
Um, if you have any questions, um, I, I'm going to have to close the room now, but if you have any further questions, you can send them on to communications at bias.ie and I'll make sure they, 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 uh, they reach later on because I'm not going to be able to answer them. <laughs> Would you like to say anything else, Liran? No, just, uh, just thank you everyone for listening. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, I'm very happy to have been able to give this talk. Thank you for the invitation. And um, yeah, uh, thank you for attending. Thanks for the great questions. Go out and explore. Well, it, can you can everyone see Emmy Nata on the page now? Yes. Yeah, I don't. I I, I wanted yes. to. Talk, I, I meant to talk about her, uh, and uh, I've, I felt like I was short on time. Uh, so I encourage anyone to look up Emmy Nata's story. She was a wonderful mathematician, and I think um, talking about the role of women in science today, she's an incredibly important figure. She was. So she was a, um, a Jewish woman in academia uh, during the uh, rise of the Third Reich. So her story is particularly interesting. She was invited to Gottingham uh, to take up a position by one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, David Hilbert, which is an honor in itself. But she was, uh, but she was, uh, this, this was objected to by the philosophical faculty. And she had to teach under the name of David, David Hilbert for four years. Eventually, she became a family, a, a, you know, a part of the Gottingham family, but then had, was forced out of her job by the Third Reich. So it's a, it's a uh, I, just while I'm seeing her image here, I encourage anyone who's interested in science, great mathematician, science and mathematics, go up, look up Emmy Nerta. It's a, it's a fascinating story. Sorry to, put, sorry to put you on the spot again, Leon, but do you know if there is an actual book about her or? There, there, I, I've not read one. There must be. If there's not, Someone should write it. <laughs> <laughs> That's your next project then, is it? Okay. Okay, right. thanks again, everybody. I'll be closing the room now. Have okay. a good day. Goodbye all. See you. Bye. Thank you.